So welcome again, everyone, to our regular Thursday afternoon program of the Planetarium Online. I'm Mike, the Planetarium Director at uh, the Planetarium in Jersey City at Liberty Science Center, the Jennifer Chosty Planetarium, the largest planetarium in the entire Western Hemisphere. And we're going to be using the same software we use in our dome on your computer screens to give you a tour of what's coming up in our skies here in May of 2020. We do have a very stormy day today, but we're hoping it's going to clear up in time to give us great seeing as we get to May, which begins, of course, tomorrow. And uh, we hope to have some pretty great weather to catch some of these things we'll be showing you. So if you have astronomy questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat. So you may know Andrew. Andrew has covered these programs the last three weeks. And we're switching roles right now. Andrew is the online question answer person today. And I'm doing the uh, live presentation of our planetarium programming. So if you have questions, put them into the chat. Our show will last around 20 minutes. And then we'll also have time afterwards to get to some of your questions. So, so glad you're all here to join us. And we're now going to go and begin our program where all astronomy has its origins looking at the nighttime sky. Or maybe not exactly the nighttime sky. We're going to go, first of all, to May 6th, this coming Wednesday. And we're going to go out right before sunset. The sun is a blazing dot of light. And we do have to wait for it to get out of the way before we can see much in the evening sky. So we're going to head out to the evening sky. And as it gets dark here next coming May 6th, try to catch a brilliant dot of light in the sky that should be visible even before it gets fully dark. You may have noticed that it's been there all of 2020 to date. So bright you might mistake it for an airplane coming in for a landing, but actually it's the planet Venus. Now Venus is brilliant for two different reasons. One, it's our nearest planet most of the time, as it is here in May. But also, it's covered in bright, shiny clouds that reflect the light really, really well. And this makes Venus the brightest thing in the sky besides the sun and the moon. It shines at minus 4.7 magnitude, which in astronomy terms just basically means it's really, really bright. Ironically, these things that make Venus so lovely make it a terrible, no good place. The atmosphere and also the thick clouds trap heat on the surface like glass in a greenhouse. So down there in Venus, it's always 861 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're doing a report on Venus, one thing's going to be really easy. There's just one temperature you have to remember. It is always 861 degrees, hot enough to melt lead. It's turned Venus into the most hellacious place in the solar system, lovely as it looks. Now we're going to lose Venus by the end of the month. Before that, let's go to the 21st of May. There is Venus kissing the horizon, but then just below it, on the 21st of May, look for a little tiny dot hanging like a pendulum from Venus. That is the planet Mercury. Now they say that one person in a thousand sees Mercury and knows they're seeing it in their entire lifetime. But if you use Venus as a guide, you can be one in that 1,000 club. On that night, Mercury will be just one degree below Venus. That's only about the width of your pinky held at arm's length. So go out there and try to join that club, checking out the planet Mercury hanging down below Venus. It would help uh, to have binoculars to try to spot it. So while Venus has an excess of atmosphere, Mercury has virtually none. With no air and being near the sun, the daytime high gets really, really high, 750 Fahrenheit. But at night, with no air to hold the heat in, it plunges down to 250 below zero, a thousand degree difference between night and day on the planet Mercury. So Mercury is, has been explored by several spacecraft. It spins very slowly. It takes 59 Earth days for one day on Mercury. So when you're in the sun, you roast. And when you're in darkness, you freeze. That, again, the elusive planet Mercury. Elusive because it's near the sun. And we only see it near the sun, either 
right after sunset or right before sunrise. So try to catch it on the 21st, hanging out there below the planet Venus. So I mentioned, uh, Chrissy mentioned the smiley face. Uh, bad news, that smiley face is an internet meme. There is actually not going to be a smiley face of the moon and stars or planets here. However, what you do have a chance to catch are the final shot of the great stars of the winter, the Dog Star series here, and the, going back to the 6th of May, just touching the horizon, brightest star in the sky. But above it, check out the bright star in the little dog, Canis Minor, Procyon. Now, the little dog consists mainly of this star, Procyon, and one star next to it. And so its stick figure is actually a stick. So imagine the vivid human imagination that saw that stick and visualized a little dog in it. Canis Minor, the only remaining two of the dogs of Orion visible. A little more obvious, maybe, these are the Gemini, the stars Pollux and Castor, similarly bright stars side by side, make the heads of the Gemini twins who went off and helped to go hunt the Golden Fleece with the great hero Jason. And then next to that, we have Origa the charioteer, so obviously a man holding a baby goat as he drives his chariot. And in fact, the bright star here, Capella, means the little goat. So the stars go away at the same time every year. They're going back behind the sun. Every year in May, we lose these great stars of winter, like the Gemini, Auriga, and the little dog. Like clockwork. There are some stars that we never lose, including this, the stars that make the Big Dipper. High overhead, they get as high as they ever get. The Dipper never sets here in New Jersey, and in May, it's very high up. If you're at 40 degrees north of the equator, the latitude of New Jersey, you never lose the Big Dipper, which is great because it does show you the road to the North Star. The North Star is not that bright, so it really is great to have a star that marks off, it's great to have a guide to find it using the Big Dipper. Once you found it, the North Star stays in place and the other stars rotate around it. It never moves. When I lived in Hawaii before I moved to New Jersey, the term we call it, used in Hawaii was Hokupa'a for the North Star, the stuck or the steadfast star. It shows you where North is and from there you can find the other directions. So the Big and Little Bears are the official names of the constellations that we often refer to as the Big and the Little Dippers. These are among two of the 88 official constellation names that all astronomers agree upon and that use, they use as a roadmap to the sky. So we're losing the stars of winter. We always have the Big and Little Dippers. The classic spring constellation is to be found in the south here. And so looking towards the south on May 6th, Try to visualize Leo the lion. Leo does look a lot more like a lion than a Riga looks like a charioteer. The first of the 12 great labors of the hero Hercules. And in the belly of the beast is a fascinating deep sky object. This is called M96, a fantastically beautiful galaxy. An island of stars like our own Milky Way, but 31 million light years away. And yet in that galaxy in 1998, we saw a star explode in a blazing supernova. Even though it was incredibly distant, this exploding star was so brilliant that we caught it in our telescopes. It's a special kind of supernova. Uh, it's a type 1A. For this kind of supernova, you have to have a white dwarf star, as we have here. There's a white dwarf. And it has to have a star next to it that the white dwarf is eating away at. So as the white dwarf consumes its companion, the white dwarf gets bigger and bigger. And then, when it gets to 1.4 times the mass of our sun, at that exact point, it blows up in an explosion. And the great thing about these kind of supernova is that they always blow up at the same point, 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And because of that, we know intrinsically how bright they are. And when you know how bright something is, then you know how far away it is. So these 1A supernovas, like the one in M96, 
are a great yardstick to measure how far away things are in the cosmos. Now on the 6th of May, we also have a full moon, and it's what's called a supermoon, but actually the last supermoon for the year 2020. A supermoon is just a moon that's full when the moon is unusually close to the Earth in its monthly orbit around the Earth. That's called perigee when it's at its nearest point. And if you have a full moon, when the moon is at the close point, it winds up being a little bigger and a little brighter than usual. And in 1979, someone had coined the term supermoon. Like all full moons, this one rises around sunset on the 6th of May and will be in the sky all night long. So check for that. It's going to come up at 7.30 and will be in the sky all night from there on. We're now stopping in the morning sky, so here we are stopping at just about 4.30 in the morning. So we still have our moon blazing away there in the morning sky, which is great here on the 7th, and also due south we have the brilliant constellation of the Scorpion, a constellation of the summer that you can already catch here in May before the first light of dawn. That said, if you're up early, uh, oh, someone is asking, uh, Anastasia is wondering, uh, why do we see Taurus the bull in winter, even though the zodiac, that's because, so this used to confuse me when I first got into astronomy. The zodiac sign for a given month is when, that's the time when those stars are behind the sun. When you can't actually ever see them. So long ago, astronomers figured out that the stars that they couldn't see were the constellation behind the sun. And so when they say that the sun is in Taurus, well, that means that you can't actually see Taurus during the month that applies to Taurus. So it actually is far easier to catch Taurus the bull in the winter time, although we did just lose it. So it was there in the April sky, but not the May, May, May sky. Great question. I see that uh, Eileen has a birthday coming up on May 3rd. Happy birthday. And uh, keep those questions coming in. And for now, we're going to look a little bit at the morning sky. We're still on May 6th, or actually May 7th, because we've gone into early, early, early on May 7th. That moon is still hanging in the sky. The moon is officially a new moon, by the way, in the morning of the 7th. That's when there's a straight line between the sun, the earth, and the moon. And so you may have some folks talking about the 7th being the night of the supermoon, but the night of the 6th is going to be a fuller moon. However, if you get socked in with rain or miss the moon on the 6th, it's going to be a great big old moon on the 7th as well. So it's not always that nature gives you a repeat performance, but you have a chance to, to see a really brilliant moon on the 7th and the 6th of May both. And uh, how often, uh, Marissa is asking how often we get a super moon. Usually two or three times a year we have a full moon when the moon is at perigee, which is the point where it's nearest to the Earth in its oval-shaped orbit around the Earth. And again, it's a very imprecise term, but we say when it's, if the moon is within 90% of its closest point to the Earth as it goes on its monthly orbit around us, we consider a full moon that happens during that point to be a supermoon. So two or three times. You may have heard the term flower moon as well. We have some terms that uh, are considered traditional uh, terms for the moon. So you'll occasionally hear this moon in May called the flower moon as well. So here we are, uh, early, early, uh, if I have a favorite planet, we're going to see, Sienna, we're going to see my favorite planet in just a moment. My favorite planet is Saturn. And so we're going to be showing that in just a moment. And fortunately, like we had Venus to help you find Mercury in the evening sky, in the morning sky, if you want to find Saturn, which is there, you have a brilliant guide, the planet Jupiter next to it, that will help you to locate it more easily. So we're going to go ahead and uh, have a look close up, first of all, at the planet Jupiter. It is so bright in the morning sky that it's kind of the morning's equivalent of Venus at night. Not as bright as Venus, maybe six times dimmer, but still brighter than any star in the sky. In the year 1610, Galileo, with his newfangled telescope, turned his telescope on the planet Jupiter and discovered little tiny dots next to Jupiter. He believed they were stars at first, but they stayed near Jupiter, but changed their position every night. So he realized right away he had found the first moons ever discovered that were not part of, that were not our own moon. So we now know of 
82 moons around the planet Jupiter, but the four that Galileo discovered are still the, by far the biggest and brightest. They're still the ones that you can see with a backyard telescope. Io, the one nearest to Jupiter, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, all orbiting this giant planet. You can fit about a thousand Earths inside of Jupiter. It's so massive. That's why it's so bright. It's far away, half a billion miles, but it's really bright because it's massive. Io, a moon that is spelled and pronounced the same way, looks a little bit like a pizza. This poor moon's got Jupiter on one side and the outer moons on the other, tugging and squeezing and pushing and pulling, and the results are constant volcanic eruptions on this moon of Jupiter. So it's the most volcanically active body. The moon Io, about the size of our own earthly moon. So now that we found Jupiter, if you just look to the left, now we have my favorite, the planet Saturn. Twice as far as Jupiter and not as big, so it's not as bright but nothing beats the sight of Saturn in a telescope. The first time you see Saturn in a telescope, you'll never forget that sight. To this day, people tell me when we show it to people at Liberty Science Center that it doesn't look real. It's hard to believe that ring can really exist. So imagine how it must have really blown the minds of the first astronomers who had good enough telescopes to discover that ring in the mid 17th century. So nowadays, we even send robot probes to the planets. The Cassini mission was at Saturn for 13 years, coming to an end in 2017. And it showed us the rings in all of their glory, made of trillions of little bits of rock and ice. And it also showed us amazing new detail about the moons of Saturn. This one here, Enceladus, about the size of New York, 300 miles across. And if you look down below the crust, Cassini realized, discovered that there's an underwater ocean or under the, the surface ocean that goes all the way around this little moon. And they discovered the existence of this because they saw great plumes of ice being shot out from the South Pole of Enceladus. So amazing discoveries in the deep solar system. We now know that many of the outer bodies of the solar system have an under the surface ocean. Now we know that water is essential for life as we know it. Could there be strange and Enceladean fish swimming in that ocean? Time will tell. We do hope to send more probes to the deep solar system to address some of these issues. I see that Anthony, like me, considers Saturn their favorite planet. We're seeing a view now here coming into view, Saturn as seen from behind a view you'd never actually see from Earth. Well, if that's not enough, there is one more planet in the morning sky to check out here in the morning skies of May. Not as brilliant as Jupiter, but if you look at it, it has a slight reddish color. It's been called the red planet, although it really is more of the orangey planet. The planet Mars, it surprises folks sometimes how faint and small Mars can get. It's only half the size of Earth, about 4,000 miles in diameter, and it's sometimes hard to make out much detail as you gaze at it, even in a good-sized telescope. But we have been very much taken with Mars over the years. At one time we thought it was possibly an abode of life. At one time we feared invaders from Mars. It's only 80 years ago we had the War of the Worlds panic where we uh, we did a, a fake television, uh, fake radio broadcast about Martian invaders. We know Mars is lifeless. We know that from the many probes that we've sent to study the red planet. We're now heading for Gale Crater, an important site on Mars caused by an asteroid impact long ago. And here also, we uh, landed the Curiosity rover in 2012. About eight years ago, our plucky car-sized rover, Curiosity, came to land on Mars, and has been examining the red planet in great detail. Among other things, it's revealed that Mars did have a lot more water in the old days than it does now. We're hoping it'll help to lay the groundwork for a eventual human mission to the planets. So that is all uh, the planet lineup there. So if you play your cards right, you could maybe catch all five planets in the month of May, even in one night, to catch 
Venus and Mercury at night, and then look for the other three planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars in the morning sky. Now we're here still in early May. Uh, here we are in the morning of the 7th. And we can also see the connecting outline for the scorpion. There is the claw, the heart antares, and the stinger of the scorpion visible in the morning sky. Now, when I, before I moved here, I lived in Hawaii, and we didn't have scorpions in Hawaii until after Western contact, so it made no sense to call this constellation the scorpion. In Hawaii, the term they use is a term you may have heard, if you know, the Disney film Moana. It's called Maui's Great Fish Hook. And the great hero Maui pulled the Hawaiian islands up from the ocean bottom. It's really great that because of that film Moana, a lot of folks have heard that story now. But whether you're, you're talking about the great fish hook named 500 years ago by the Hawaiians, or the scorpion, a term that goes back 2,500 years to the Babylonians, we can use these long ago invented names for the stars because the stars stay in the same patterns for hundreds and even thousands of years. So tomorrow, you won't see Antares going over this way, and this star won't go that way. The stars remain fixed because they're so far away, like cars on a very distant freeway. You can barely tell their motion. However, the planets are closer. They're only tr millions of miles away, not trillions of miles away. And we can actually see them move. The word planet actually means wanderer or a wandering star. So not in the course of one night, but if we go through the rest of May, keep your eye on Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon. We're going to do a time lapse. Imagine we take one picture at night and turn that into a movie. You'll see the beautiful ballet of the planets against a starry background. So the real speed demon here is the Moon, because the Moon goes around Earth once every 30 days. It's moving far more quickly than anything else, and it's going to change phase as well as you see going on here. And so if you're up on the 13th or 14th, early in the morning, you'll have the moon just past third quarter next to the planet Mars. So check that out. A planet that's close to us, like Mars, moves more quickly, whereas Saturn here and Jupiter are moving so slow it's kind of hard to tell they're moving at all. But they are moving, and this motion is going to bring them around to the evening sky by the time we get to July and August. So we're going to have these planets very well placed in the evening sky for viewing this coming summer. You won't have to get up at 4.30 in the summertime to catch Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. So that's an overview, so with a chance to catch all five planets, that doesn't happen very often. We want to give a shout out, by the way, to Digistar, the software program that allows us to create programming like this. Digistar has been uh, a great tool that we've been able to use here, made by Evans and Sutherland. And as we wrap up our formal program, we now wanted to see uh, if you have any questions that you would like us to answer. Again, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the box. I uh, see, for example, that uh, Shiri is asking, how many constellations are there in the solar system? Well, there are no constellations in the solar system. The constellations are made of these stars that are far, far, far beyond our solar system. And all over the world, people have had different ideas of what the starry patterns represent. So, for example, I mentioned Maui's fish hook being a Hawaiian term for the stars that the Greeks and Romans called the, or still call the, the scorpion. But to avoid confusion and to make sure they had a map of the sky they all agreed upon, in 1922, the International Astronomical Union agreed to uh, agree upon 88 individual constellations. So there's 88 official constellations that are now used as a map of the nighttime sky. How many moons are there in outer space? We don't know. We're only now beginning to discover, a question from Lynn I should mention. We're beginning to discover now, we now have over 4,000 planets around nearby stars, and so each one of them has even one moon, then we're talking billions and billions of moons out there in the uh, known universe. Okay, Becky, I love the fact that Becky is asking, is Pluto 
a planet again. So this is a great debate. So I mentioned the International Astronomical Union. They are the only organization that has the right to name objects in the night sky. They reclassified Pluto as a dwarf planet in 2006. And so on our next one o'clock presentation, at one o'clock next Thursday, we're doing a whole program on that great debate. Uh, we're getting a question, can you see Uranus and Neptune from Cassia, is it? No, that's a good question. We didn't know of Uranus and Neptune until the telescope came along. I say it's interesting because if you know, know exactly where to look, you can actually see Uranus with your naked eye. But no one ever noticed it until the days of the telescope. So they are both in the sky, but you do need a telescope to see Neptune under every circumstance. And you would really need a telescope for Uranus unless you're under perfect viewing conditions in a dark sky with perfect vision, you might be able to catch it with your naked eye. Uh, so Isabel and Emmy are wondering, does Uranus have rings? Yes, in fact, all the big outer planets, the great balls of gas, so uh, that's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they all have ring systems. Saturns, however, are the only ones visible in a telescope from Earth. They're bright and shiny. The rings of Uranus were discovered uh, in, 19, in the 1970s, watching Uranus go in front of a star, star. They noticed that the light dropped off before and after Uranus blocked the star off, and they realized from that that there had to be rings blocking uh, the light before and after that eclipsing or occultation of the star. And we know that Jupiter has a very dark ring, very hard to see, and also Neptune has rings. So Lisa is asking on behalf of her six-year-old son, might we discover more moons with Jupiter? Yes, there's a really, really, really good chance. Uh, until last summer, we were always saying in our planetarium shows that Saturn had the most moons at 79. But then they announced just last summer 20 more moons discovered around the planet Jupiter. And so we're probably going to be discovering way more moons, little tiny moons mainly, around those giant planets. So that basically is, uh, and we're pretty sure that 82 is not the ultimate final count. A white, uh, we had a question about whether a white dwarf is the same as a white hole. Now, a white dwarf is just a very compact star. Uh, a white hole is a theoretical concept. We know that black holes are places that draw in matter to them. There's been some theorizing that maybe there's also white holes where matter gets emitted on the other side, basically, of a black hole. That is more theoretical, whereas we know that for sure white dwarfs uh, do exist. Okay, Christina is wondering, is the North Star constant? Why doesn't it move like the other stars? That is an amazing question. So the North Star that we have right now is going to be good for about a thousand more years. It was good for a thousand years before now. The North Star is exactly over the North Pole right now. So we basically point right to it. And being over the axis of our rotation, as the world turns, it stays in place over the uh, the, the pole of the Earth. And so it does very, very faithfully mark off the, the no direction north. Now, the Earth does wobble very slowly and points to different North Stars at different times. So we're very fortunate in the year 2020 to have a great North Star. Uh, but as time goes on, we'll have brighter stars that are not as close to true north. It's like the star Vega down the road will be a North Star. So it's not always going to be our North Star, but Enjoy it while we got it, because it is a perfect North Star, Polaris, the Pole Star, right over our North Pole, exactly showing you where North is. Bob is wondering, do, you, do we know how old uh, some planets are? Most planets were formed over uh, around 5 billion years ago, when the solar system itself came together. So they're all quite ancient. And how many stars are there? Well, Christina is wondering about that. And if you have, well, until the 1920s, we didn't really know if there were other galaxies, other island universes besides the Milky Way. There's maybe 200 
uh, billion stars in the Milky Way. We know nowadays there's at least as many galaxies as there are stars in our own galaxy. So between 200 billion and a trillion galaxies, so if you take 200 billion stars per galaxy times a trillion galaxies, that's how many. So a crazy, crazy amount out there. So uh, the Looking through the commentary here. How do black holes form? We had a question on that. So black holes basically, when a star ends its life, if it's a really big star, much more massive than our sun, when they collapse down after they come to the end of their life, they collapse down with so much gravitational power, they turn into this force from which nothing, even light, can get away from. Now to be a black hole, you do have to be more massive than our own sun. Uh, so our own sun won't go that way, but it doesn't take much more than a solar mass to turn into a black hole. Now all of our former presentations that we do here are available also on our YouTube channel for Liberty Science Center. We had a great program on black holes just recently, so you can also go and check out our shows on black holes and also on exoplanets if you would like to learn more about the, uh, the, those two topics. Christine is wondering who made the names for the constellations. Uh, it's all over the map. We use primarily Greek and Roman constellation names now, but a lot of those are based on ideas that came from the Babylonians. And then some constellation names, like the constellations that you can see when you go below the equator that the Greeks and Romans couldn't see, were only invented by astronomers uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. We'll uh, take a couple of more questions before we end our program. Uh, Tiffany, Tiffany is wondering, do stars make noise? No, there is, in the vacuum of space, there's no actual sound. And so even though we in our business like to show stars blowing up and have a kaboom sound going with them, in the vacuum of space, there is no actual sound. How old is Earth? Gina was wondering. We're thinking in the neighborhood of five billion years, give or take a couple of weeks. So yes, we've been around for a long time. Fortunately, our sun is an average sun that lives a long time and doesn't burn through its matter very quickly. So we're expecting at least five billion more years out of both our sun and uh, our planet, home, our home planet. Uh, uh, Prasanna is wondering, will the sun go into a black hole? Uh, no, not likely. Black holes, uh, as long as you don't get too close to be drawn into them, can't uh, do much damage, and we don't expect a black hole to absorb our sun. How are the planets named is a question that we also have. So the planets were named, primarily were named for the gods of the Greeks and Romans, at least the, 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 the terms we use in English come from Greeks and Romans, and also kind of the Norse versions. Uh, and so, for example, Mercury, uh, it was a messenger of the gods. Maybe, maybe not, but maybe because Mercury moves very quickly in the sky, it reminded the Greeks and Romans of their fast-moving winged foot messenger. Mars, a vivid imagination, might have seen the color of blood or fire in the slight orange shade of Mars. So long ago it became, for example, the god of, of warfare. Uh, Olga is wondering how old the Andromeda galaxy is, about the same age as ours, and our two galaxies will be moving together, joining with each other uh, in about four billion years. So they've been around billions and billions. Uh, Nancy wondering if black holes are only in the middle of the galaxy. No, there are stellar sized black holes, smallish black holes throughout the galaxy, but we're also sure, good point here, that there is a black hole in the heart of virtually every galaxy. So black holes is another thing that, as time goes on, we're discovering more and more that they are ubiquitous throughout the cosmos. All right, let's take one more sh question. And then, okay, so uh, Nikita is wondering how many moons does Saturn have? Right now, the count is 79. But as I was saying earlier, we could very well have many, many, many more than that as we discover more of these smaller ones. So with that, 
We're going to wrap up our program here. Come back and join us at 1 o'clock this coming Thursday to talk about Pluto and all about Pluto and what makes a planet a planet. And also, if you want to learn more about the supermoon on the 6th, we're doing a special evening presentation of Planetarium Online at 5 p.m. on the 6th of May. So you can see our show and then walk right out, hoping this weather clears up, and catch a beautiful view of the supermoon that night. So go to our website for all other information about our whole range of online programming that we're offering. And I'd like to thank you again very much for joining us for our Planetarium online program. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you again. <laughs>